The following interview was conducted with uh, Robert A. Greencorn, the F. Games Slater Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Chemical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 30th, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born and your parents and early years, school. I was <coughs> born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is uh, a little further north than here. Uh, I don't know what to say about my parents. I had two. Okay. <laughs> and, Do you have any uh, brothers or sisters? And what was school? One brother. Like? His name is Frederick. He died quite young. He had ALS. Okay. And I went to the Oshkosh Public Schools. Was it for eight grades? And then what about high school? What was high school, next? Oshkosh, yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit about high school. What uh, Was it a large school? And were any yeah, student Yeah, it was pretty big. My graduating class was almost 400. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Any student activities that you participated in there? Or? Oh, I did just a little bit of everything, I guess. I played four sports and... Uh, what sports did you play? Uh, football, wrestling, diving, and track. Very good. Nice yeah. variety. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> How did the football team do? Not too badly? Not too good. <laughs> <laughs> track and field, well that gave you an option yeah. then. Okay, and then uh, did, after high school, college, tell us a little bit about that, where you went and... Well, I joined the life. Navy and, uh, oh. when I was still in high school. When you got out of high school? Well, I was still in high school, in oh. fact. And when I graduated, uh, they sent me to the University of Wisconsin in Madison for four semesters. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's, that's how I started school. And then, well, did, uh, did I was in the naval uh, aviation program. Okay. So I went to flight training in Pensacola and Corpus um, <clears throat> Christi. This is during World War II? I'm sorry? After, what war? When would this No, this would be 1948. Eight, okay. Um, after the four semesters, then you had to serve in the military. Tell us how to... How well, to four semesters, and then we went to ground school and through flight school. Okay. And then I was supposed to get out, but the Korean War started, and I stayed in for an extra year and a half. Okay. Whereabouts did you, were you over in that area? or? Where, yes, I was in Korea. I was stationed in Woodby Island, Washington, and then uh, Barbers Point, Hawaii, and then in, in Japan during the Korean War. Okay, okay. <clears throat> and after the, then did you come back to college? Tell us after you got out of the service. After I got out of service, I went back. To, to the, what, University of Wisconsin? Yes. Okay. And then... What, did you get your uh, undergraduate and then what? Well, I got a BS, happened? MS, and PhD. Since I, when I came back, I was a junior. Or I was a senior, in fact, right. so I okay. just stayed there. What was your and major? I was married, so it was... What was your major while you were in college? Chemical engineering. Okay, and that was your PhD, was in chemical engineering? Chemical engineering and computer science, yeah. Good, okay. Let's move on your, uh, <coughs> uh, the career path prior to coming to Purdue. You can tell us a little bit about that? After you got your PhD? Well, I went to Norway for a year. I was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Norwegian Engineering College. And then I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I worked for Exxon for five years in production research. And then I taught at Tulsa while I was there. Then I went to Marquette for two years, and I came here okay. in 1965. Okay, okay. That brings us to Purdue then. Mm -hmm. And you were uh, associate professor when you came in School of Chemical uh, College of Chemical Engineering, uh, when you first came here. You were, then you moved into the headship, correct? That's correct. I came as an associate professor. Okay. Can you drink water, do you think? Oh, can we stop for a minute? Uh, he needs some water, I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. Okay. Okay, we're on. Okay. Chemical engineering, you're the head of the school. Tell us a little bit about the enrollment and your responsibilities and duties. Just ahead and... Well, I, at that time, I think enrollment was about 300 students, 350. Uh -huh. We were fairly full. Uh, I just did the normal things heads do, budget, sign teaching, etc. Okay. But I taught myself and did research all that time. What was your research areas there? Actually, I have two research areas, but um, the main was flow and porous media, which is, means flow through underground. I, when I worked in industry, I worked for oil production for oil company, getting oil out of the ground. And so that's, that's what I did research on when I came here. Okay. Plus I did research in thermodynamics, which... Well, tell us for the research, so just explain just a little bit on it, so they, researchers studying this, they might, so they understand, might make a comment or two. Yeah. Well, what I was interested in in, in porous media was 
the movement of fluids underground and how they how they dispersed, basically both from a experimental point of view and a mathematical or numerical level point of view. In thermodynamics, which happened to be my thesis area, and I never got away from it, uh, I did basically uh, equations of state type research with graduate students, obviously. Okay. And with other faculty. Were you uh, involved in faculty? Did you hire the faculty to increase the size of the school, faculty wise? I replaced there? almost the entire faculty, yeah. <laughs> that must have been a challenge. It was. Uh, the, the school was. was was uh, not in good shape as it should have been, and uh, okay. so I hired about seven or nine faculty members. That's pretty good. What about fundraising during the time that you were there? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, we uh, used to get fundraising from from companies, but it was still Hubdy's time, and Hubdy didn't particularly push it's fundraising. A little different then, right? Yeah. Okay. And you worked with alumni. You deal. Uh, you worked with alumni too. You're alumni of the school. Oh sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, then you moved on to assistant dean for research. Can you tell us how that came about and explain a little bit about what the responsibilities were there for that? Well, uh, John Hancock was the dean at that point, and he wanted us to get into interdisciplinary research. It started a long time ago, and uh, so my function was to set up an interdisciplinary research atmosphere in the schools of engineering. And that's basically what I worked on, plus building the Potter Center, which was an interdisciplinary building. And so it, that's really what I did as a social or assistant dean. How did they select the site for the Potter Building? Was that uh, I haven't the slightest idea. It just was there. It just there started being built, right? That's where they decided to put it. I <laughs> understand. Just like I asked Walter Wade, who was the head of physical plant in those days, how they could make all the bricks look alike, and he just the straight faces. We have a set of standard bricks, and he showed them to me. You got to match those bricks. <laughs> I remember that. Could you explain uh, uh, what the engineering experiment station? Uh, well, many researchers have asked me that. Well, the, see the, in the literature. Oh, you're familiar with the agricultural research. Exactly. The engineering community had another a, a system of uh, of experiment stations just like the egg did, but it wasn't funded anywhere near the level that the agriculture was. So basically, the uh, the I guess you'd say the, the the station did all the the contracting for research in, in engineering for the and, schools in this. Yeah, and did the uh, did all the well. I did a lot of time in Washington hunting funds, and uh, so that's really what the station. Pretty much, it didn't do experimental work like the Ag Station does. Mm -hmm. It was it was originally set up back in the 20s to do that, but it never got funded by the federal government, so it never went on to do mm -hmm. that much. So basically, all of the non-department or school units were under the the uh, experiment station. For example, the Institute for Inter Interdisciplinary Studies, the various centers that, that existed at that time, and so on. Okay. What was the uh, level of government funding? Was it supportive during those days? Uh, your contacts? Uh, it increased, or how did, does it? Oh yeah, our support increased steadily from uh -huh. from that time on. I guess you'd say. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> You and uh, I inter what was the interdisciplinary engineering studies? That was another thing you said that you were involved in too. Was that an institute that? Yeah, well, the, the, I was yeah. the first director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Study, Engineering Studies. Okay. And we we I, <clears throat> I did that as soon as we as I became assistant dean. So I was director of that institute, and we started up five centers. The biomedical engineering center started then, way back then. Good. The Environmental Engineering Center, the Depart Transportation Center, and we had an energy center. In fact, we had a coal research center at that point in time, and that was all housed in the institute. Okay. Oh. And then you were the associate dean for engineering, and then, then you became the director of the engineering experiment station. Yeah, that was just sort of a progression that went on. Went with it, right? <laughs> John um, Hancock didn't want to spend his time doing that. He was starting to raise money, but by that time we were starting to Art Hansen was here, and there was more of a... That's when the President's Council and things sort of got moving in that yeah, direction, yeah. right. Well, tell us a little bit about the assist, your associate provost and vice president of programs for Purdue Research Foundation. Do well, again, when I went over that? to the Poverty Hall as vice president, I was responsible for all research funding. The graduate dean was responsible for the students, and I was responsible for research funding. And so um, I had to be 
the vice president of the Research Foundation because the Research Foundation contracts all the research from the university. The university, I don't think then, and I don't think now, is allowed by state law to contract. So you have the IU Foundation contracts for IU and the Purdue Research Foundation contracts for, uh, for uh, Purdue. And it's also a sort of a depository for money, so they grew up uh, getting funding, which was then utilized to spend on various research projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I signed all the contracts as, as Vice President of the Research Foundation. And uh, so that's why I was Vice President of the Research Foundation. I was Vice President of the Associate Provost because I had to be an officer of the university to be kind of, it, well, it gets complicated to be the okay. Vice President for programs. And I also was responsible for the Purdue part, IUPUI, at that point. We had... How, how did that, what was, what was that liaison? Are you going to elaborate, explain that, or IUPUI? Or well, what? IUPUI back in those days was sort of a, uh, wasn't quite as tightly organized as it is now. It was, it was quite loose. Uh, there was a vice president from, from IU who sort of ran the place, and they had an executive dean who was played like provost, I guess you'd call it. And I was the other vice president from Purdue, so we were sort of a management group for that particular thing. We had, Purdue had three deans down there, and science and engineering, and, and then there was some s smaller uh, this is at IUPUI? technology. Yeah, at IUPUI. Oh, okay. And those deans all reported to me, and I spent a lot of time at IUPUI. In fact, I, I drove that trip to Indianapolis about five times a week. <laughs> you could do it minutes. in your sleep, right? Yeah, I could do it. <laughs> Better in not sleep. do it. <laughs> but anyway, it was an interesting. It was an interesting time because IUP, I think, grew up from a, a what you might call a, a regional campus to a, what I would right. say a Did pretty, you have pretty any, good yeah. city university. Did you have any contact with the other regional campuses as well? Yes, and I did. So? As a matter of fact, I was again responsible for the Purdue parts of the other regional sure. campuses. Uh, back before. When they first started, there was a vice president for regional campuses, but that sort of disappeared. Oh, there used to be a position? Such there as was that. a specific position as vice president for regional campuses. And so I, because they did research, I interacted with all of them. Right. Um, <clears throat> but it was an interesting time, because I also interacted with the state government at that point in time in economic development. We started that stuff a long time ago. It, sometimes it doesn't sound that way, but we did. And so I worked with, with the lieutenant governor, who was John Mutz in those days, and the head of the Department of Commerce. And we actually wrote a strategic plan for economic development for the state of Indiana. And we did a lot of, I did a lot of stuff with, with uh, not as much with the legislature as with the administration, with Governor Orr and sure. John Mutz and, and yeah. uh, so on. What was the, the relate, wasn't there a state, somebody from Purdue that also worked with the legislature, or was this something different? What, oh, yeah, no, the, John Hicks used to, was that? his function was to, was to lobby the legislature for money for Purdue. Okay. And then after John, John Huey was in there, and then after John Huey was Terry Stree, and then I don't, I don't know who's in there now. Sure. Terry just retired, I think. Right. Yeah, their main function was to, was to work with the legislature working on the, the budget, state budget for Purdue. Right. My function was a little bit different. My, I worked with the legislature a little bit and with the administration on economic development. In fact, I wrote the proposal for the technical assistance program at that time, and that's when it got started. The technical information service, which was just shut down recently, I guess. Right. And uh, several other, what was called the Pacific Rim Initiative. We, we started the international programs. International programs also reported to me, and it changed quite radically from when when I first started to when, it, when I got in, in what way could you, would you say? Well, we were, we were much more aggressive in, in international programs. We were part of a, the combination of the Big Ten and the University of Chicago, which was called the, the acronym as we see it, the Midwest University Corporation mm -hmm. for International Activities. And we did a tremendous amount of international activities at that time. I was on the board of the, you see, I was the chairman of the board for, for quite a while. And we, we were doing international type research, mainly helping countries to do research. Sure. At our peak, we were doing about a half a billion dollars worth of research. This was mm -hmm. this is the Big Ten, collectively. Sure, right. Yeah. How did the TAP program, were you involved, how did that come about? Because there, uh, there I just was wrote a proposal and turned it in to, to the well, people. Well, was the statewide technology program in existence at that time? Yes, the statewide technology program was in existence. Oh. Statewide technology, again, is a, 
a uh, educational program. Okay. They didn't do any interaction, that much interaction with research or with companies. When the economic development push took place, which is in the early 80s, and I wrote several proposals for the, for the university. One was the technical assistance program, and mm -hmm. it got funded by the, uh, by the legislature. And it, it has really grown. It's grown quite significantly. It's about $8 million right now, if I recall. Right. I talked to Dave yeah. the other day. And they have sites in different... Uh... Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, there are sites... I don't remember. Don Gentry is the one who set up all those sites. Mm -hmm. I, there must be about three or four at the current time. Mm -hmm. And But it's a, it's a combination of having, like in the research park, having a, a incubator program at various places. And so this is what Don set up. Mm -hmm. okay. The technical assistance program operates by a project basis. They, they interact with the industry. Industry brings projects to them and they sure. they work on them. Is that on a contract basis? Or uh, not yeah, sort of, but sort not, of. Not, not, not quite so formal as All a right. contract. But right. enough of a contract so if the kids gets legal, they can get <laughs> out of it. You mentioned that the uh, TI is Technical Information Service, but you mentioned that that has now, it does not exist Yeah, anymore. no, I wrote the proposal for that also. One of my sidelights was doing infor library information systems. I don't know if you realize that. No, Mimi probably. Drake and, and I and two other people wrote the library information system for the Purdue Library. This was a copyrighted program which was sold out and so on. Sure. In fact, they just shut that particular program down last year. It had huh. been on the I system. remember when Mimi Drake was here. That was quite a while yeah, ago. Yeah. I've forgotten. It had a funny name, but it, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then you, uh, you moved into the dean of the grad school. How did well, that was, I was vice, well, when, 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 who was I going to say, when Fred Andrews left. Okay. Steve Baring decided that he didn't want to have a provost anymore. He wanted an academic vice president. And he, then he had the vice presidents like me report to him rather than to the provost. Uh, and so what happened then when Bob Ringel moved in from being dean of the graduate school as provost, or as vice, academic vice president, I have to keep these words, he and I decided there shouldn't be a separate dean. And so we combined the two programs. And the dean's job and the, and the vice president for research because I was re renamed the vice president for research even though that's what I was about that time and then uh, um, so I took over the graduate school and uh, gave lots of money back to the <laughs> central administration and then later on they decided that they wanted to change the level of involvement decided not to make that a vice president's level job there's some significance to being an officer of the university which could or could not create problems. Okay. Yeah. Did, what uh, what changes, if any, did you make in the grad school? And how long were you? Well, being I wasn't there? there that long. I was oh. there about a year. I actually thinned out the whole operation and and, and uh, modernized it. I guess is the right term. Put in a computer system. Right. And so on. And now they're even the theses are electronic too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It used to be the hard copy. Yeah. Well, we we were hoping to have everything done. I, I was impatient, but they're finally getting there. <laughs> Oh, uh, one of the centers I would, was going to ask you about was an, uh, used to be a Solar Energy Research Institute. That was a, is that a, probably doesn't exist anymore. The was Environmental it? Engineering Center. Are those what was, what was it? Solar that? Energy Research Institute sometime in 1970 or something like that. Oh, that was that was a center. Yes, that was I a center. Some it was research in the, that came it, up was in the industry. It, it eventually became what was called the Laboratory of Renewable Resource Engineering. Lori is the. Right. Which still exists. Exactly. And that was right. in the, the power center. Okay. But the solar energy was, you realize solar doesn't just mean the sun shining. If, if you're talking about using corn for energy, then that's a solar energy result. And that's really what was involved. Okay. Okay. I see. And the environmental engineering center was another one that was going on at one time. Yes. We probably. started the environmental center. And uh, well, as I said, when we started the institute, we started five centers. Okay. okay. The biomedical engineering, for example, and so on. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, it doesn't look, they all, those all look like recent, but they really aren't very recent. They started a long time ago. A long time ago, right, yeah. And you mentioned a, a comment before, you retired, tell us about you retired a couple of times. I think researchers will enjoy it. Well, that. when I was, at, <laughs> I don't know, I guess the rules are still the same. When you reach 65, <laughs> you can no longer be an officer of the university, I guess. Or, so you have to retire from whatever your administration position is. 
So I retired as vice president for research and the graduate school. But then Steve Bering asked me to be a special assistant to him because one of the side items I did, I, I did the lobbying in Washington for the university. So he had a lot of contacts. So I had a lot, I, I mean, I did that for 20 years. And so he asked me to go on and continue to do that. And for a variety of reasons, I then also became director of the technical assistance program because uh, the, the current director had left. And, and you'd written the proposal. I'd written the proposal. And in fact, it, well, the, the TAP director reported to me all the time I was vice president. <laughs> and then, then I became the, for, for several years as part of the special assistant okay. program. And I also did some other major funding efforts in the research area. All right. You've noticed then funding has changed over time. The fundraising has changed, certainly with the strategic Yeah, well, I, I, sp I spent the last 10 years of my administrative duty raising money, federal money, no, not, not, right. not uh, and I interacted with the, with the, uh, with the delegation in Washington. With sure. The How has that changed in the time that you've been involved in it, if any? Well, I started it. There wasn't a program to interact with the federal government other than what was done in agriculture. The ag people have a long history of, sure. of doing that. And so when I became vice president, one of the jobs I had besides IUPY and other was to, to uh, upgrade our program in, in Washington. At that point, we had just people from the sponsored programs in, in PRF would interact a little bit with the various program managers, but there was no, um, I don't know what to call it, positive effort to try and get more money at that point. So we, uh, we put together, Strother Arnett and I put together a strategic plan for how to interact with the, with the Washington scene. And that's what you were involved in? That's what yeah. I was involved in. Oh, okay. But yeah. That was another side issue. Okay, okay. And, um, and you've re now what's the other retirement that uh, that's too well, and when I when 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 I be in 2000, when I became 70, I retired, and uh, I was I was the special assistant to the president at that point in time, and that's when Jeske was coming in. Well, they didn't have anybody to do the Washington thing, and there was a, a possibility of a big proposal that they wanted written, so they hired me as a consultant for two years to continue doing the Washington thing and to write. We wrote a proposal for a advanced manufacturing, which was done at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so then after two years, and then I retired again. I ceased <laughs> being a... <laughs> but you keep active every day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about, you've got a couple of awards. Um, one is that the, the R. Games Slater Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering. Yeah. That's very nice. Well, actually, you didn't have them all down there, but that's all right. Okay. I'm, well, I'm that's a fellow very, of ASE. That's, you know. And you're a fellow in the American Society of Engineering Education. Yeah. Do you, well. Have you continued to keep active in the professional? In the oh, academy? not very much anymore. Mm -hmm. I, the dues for emeritus people is almost non-existent, so I send my dues in. <laughs> uh, what about family? What, uh, tell us a little about that. Do you have children? And yes, I have uh, three children, uh -huh. uh, two girls and a boy. Uh, they go to Purdue? Did they graduate from Purdue? Uh, one of them got a bachelor's and a master's. The other two went here part-time, but they never finished. Uh -huh. My son works in a, for a, oh, a medium-sized furniture fixture company, and he lives in Spencer. My daughter, oldest daughter, has worked for, uh, I can't remember, the, whoever runs a, well, she worked for, Whoever used to run errors, I don't remember. I know Macy's took errors over, but I not. But she worked for them. For, for she's them. a she's a in fact, what do you call retailing? her? She's a visual designer. She okay. now works in the in in Chicago in the at the Wood, Woodfield Mall for uh, Lord and Taylor. Okay. Okay. And my uh, my younger daughter is a got a B.S. and an M.S. in, in instructional design from Purdue, and she's a consultant. And right now she is consulting with IBM. On writing, uh, what you believe, units for instruction for AT and T. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a sequence. <laughs> so she's she's done that for about yeah six or eight years. Right. What what are you uh, involved in? What are your retirement activities? What sort of things have you been doing since you're well, after the I mean, your fourth? Yeah. Well, up. I used to fly. I used to okay. have an airplane, but we didn't. Oh, you had an airplane. It. Well, several of us owned an airplane. We sold it a couple of years ago. In a, I decided that I, I don't really want to fly around in circles. 
I flew too much in the Navy to do that. <laughs> um, what kind of a plane did you have? We, uh, well, I started out with, with uh, when I first started out with the Purdue Club back in the 60s, we had three airplanes. We this is a Purdue Club? Y oh, yeah, no. it was oh. a Purdue Faculty Staff Air Club, it was called. Okay. And uh, we had three airplanes. We had a, uh, old Cessnas, a 210, and a 182, and a 172. We finally gradually lost people in airplanes until uh, two years ago we sold our final plane, which is the 182. Do you keep the airplane out at the airport? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. They probably want the plane back. There's not that much activity out there anymore. There's no airlines. Know. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's and then so now I do research in solar physics. Okay. And uh, I'm learning how to play the classical guitar. In fact, I'm missing practice right now. Oh. And uh, so I, I keep pretty busy. Right. I, I work out at the Ishmael Center for an hour every day, and I I started with Ishmael in 1965 in a program. A, that's been lawyers. going a long time. I've been at it a yes, long time. Right. He left a legacy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about um, an outstanding event in your life? I was shot down in Korea. <laughs> that was fairly. Wow. Odd. I don't know if I'd call it an outstanding event. It certainly was a significant event. Yeah. And what were you captured? No, we we uh, we were we were doing uh, strafing of, of some gunboats. We were about 600 miles behind the lines, and we got hit. And uh, I was at, in a patrol plane, a, and a twin-engine plane. And we uh, we flew out over the Yellow Sea and had to ditch the plane. It was burning, and the wing was burning, so we ditched the airplane. We got in our little boats and paddled away from land because they weren't taking prisoners in those days. And we got picked up about five or six hours later by a, a uh, British cruiser. So we spent. Five hours in the LLC. Oh wow! That, I would say that that's a memorable event in your life. Yeah, right? that's a, that's a that's a one of them. Yeah. Well, sure. My wife will get upset. Getting married was a memorable event. I guess. <laughs> that's definitely right. Yeah. <laughs> when you think back on your career, as some couple comments for the researchers, what would you like to share with us as you look back on your career at Purdue and continuing career? Any comments that you'd like to share? Well, I don't know. I guess. It, I don't know how to say this and I don't have it sound wrong. Unfortunately, nowadays, as a faculty member, doing research requires an extensive amount of fungi raising. Right. And I think people who don't recognize that have a hard time doing research. And I think that's something that somehow has to be brought home early on to these people who want to. Sure. Back when I started going into teaching, it was sort of a genteel professor. Right? It's changed. It's, it's a. It's a really difficult. Yeah. What prompted thing. you to go into teaching? You had been in industry before. Well, I was in industry for five years. Um, I don't know. I just always liked teaching when I was when I was in college. I was a teaching right. assistant, a graduate assistant. Right. And then when I worked for Exxon, I actually taught at the University of Tulsa in, at night, and Exxon let me do that. And uh, and I decided I wanted to keep doing it. It's it's a there are a lot of disadvantages. The pay is not really great relative to industry. All this frustration with getting money for, for students, et cetera. There are a lot of challenges. A lot of challenges. Right. But the freedom is there. You can do what you want to do. You, you can fail on your own. You don't have to have somebody else help you. Yeah. So I think that's, then I, I pretty much uh, don't regret it. I mean, I, I did the right thing. Had to do all over again. I'd probably do the same. Right. Thing. Yes. Yeah. Any uh, questions that you'd like to ask or comments that something that I didn't bring up that you'd like to share in closing at all? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. we've covered most everything. Yeah. And uh, you're keeping, you still keep pretty busy, then, don't you? Which yeah, I nice. do. As a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. Um, Johnny traveled. Then they've been retired. You. And oh, I don't. I, well, <laughs> when I was involved, I was involved. I was on the board of Argonne, and I was on the board of UCAR, and I was on the Right. And I that traveled, pleasure travel. I travel so much, I'm, I get tired of travel. <laughs> and you took your plane, and that was kind of I travel. I flew myself to most, lots of places. So. Sure. Right. No, we, we, my wife and I take a trip a year now. And, uh, right. And we live, we live in Florida half time. So we're, oh, do you really? Yes, oh, that's yeah. nice. 
That gives you a nice kind of a little bit of a break then. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of like going on sabbatical. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Dr. Sure. Kern, Greencorn. I appreciate that for the interview. And I think that the researchers will benefit by your experiences and reminiscences with us. Okay. I thank you. Okay. Uh -huh.